time for the good, the bad, and the ugly dog edition. We start it. with the good, a blind dachshund and his guide dog friend finding their forever home together. OJ needs Blue Dozer to help lead him around. They were briefly separated after being surrendered by their owner, but a shelter in Virginia was able to get them adopted together. Love that. And look at that little guy smiling nice. at the bottom. Thank you. All right, next to bad, a rare skin condition leaving another dachshund looking more like a beefy wiener dog. Doctors finding Trevor had a hole in his windpipe, oh. causing him to balloon up. But don't worry, he's back down to normal size and self. Oh, I thought he was just so big because he was eating so Look good. at that. All right, I'm glad he's okay. <laughs> Finally, the ugly five-month-old Tegan got himself stuck in a rough spot, pushing his head through a dryer vent after chewing through the wall. His owner had to use vegetable oil to get her out, but she's okay. That's the good news. Oh, let's end on that note. That we'll is great. Fox and Friends starts right now. Thanks, guys. Mark your calendar one week from today, June 12th, 9 a.m. Singapore time. The historic meeting will take place. Ultimately, he wants to see denuclearization of the peninsula. That's the that's the top goal here. and That's what he's focused on doing. That's what the talks next week will center on. In one of the remaining blockbuster cases facing the Supreme Court this term, the justices handed a Christian Baker a win by a 7-2 margin after he declined to make a custom cake for a gay couple. Former President Bill Clinton does not think that he owes was Monica Lewinsky an apology. I apologize to everybody in the world. You didn't apologize to her. I have not talked to her, but I did say publicly on more than one occasion that I was sorry. If you can't stand for the flag, you can't stand next to the commander in chief. President Trump calling off the White House visit by the Super Bowl champion Philadelphia Eagles as the national anthem dispute heats up yet again. Works hard and played on it. We had it made on it. We were born and raised. Hi, everybody. It's June 5th, 2018. Come on in. Come into our living room. We got three hours of, of cable casting starting right now. <laughs> Good morning, Welcome to the show, Brian. Are you well, well? Yeah, I'm just, uh, I was just tweeting out something about uh, Philadelphia and how do the fans feel about their team not going to the White House. The president, they were only going to send about nine players. The president said, if you're only going to send nine, forget it. It's off. But the fans are still welcome. That's right. So you got about a thousand yeah. could be showing up. We're going to be throwing a big birthday bash for America instead. Right. <laughs> well, a celebration for America at 3 o'clock. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Plus, uh, you, there was that... Uh, Ruling yesterday by the U.S. Supreme Court, 7-2, to two, finding for that man, that's Jack Phillips. He's the owner of Master Peak Cake Shop out in Colorado. The Supreme Court said that uh, essentially he won his case because the commission out in Colorado did not take into consideration his feelings, only the uh, feelings of the uh, people who had brought the lawsuit. So yeah. we're going to find out what where it all goes for him from here. Yeah, the first cable news on. interview he's giving. A big win for him, so we're going to talk to him at 8.20 later on this morning. And Larry Kudlow at the bottom of the hour with some breaking news on the president and trade. 8 o'clock. Yeah. I believe he's coming up. Uh, 8 o'clock. Yeah. I believe big show so. ahead. But there is a lot going on this morning as it relates to North Korea. It's a date. The White House revealing more information on the high-stakes summit between President Trump and Kim Jong-un now just one week away. But the anticipated talks are being met with a list of demands now from the Democrats. Mm. Hey, yeah, where were those demands when the Iranian deal was up for grabs? Griff Jenkins is live in Washington with the latest. And Griff, you're always smiling. Well, it's always good to join you. Good All morning, right. guys. I tell you, he's not smiling. Are the Democrats are feeling a bit left out? That summit starts a week from today, June twelfth, nine a.m. Singapore time. That's Monday evening at nine p.m. Eastern here in the U.S. That historic summit begins, according to White House. Uh, Press Secretary Sarah Sanders, who just days after receiving a letter, Kim Jong-un's number two, hand delivering that letter right there to the president. Now, Sanders wouldn't go into specifics on what was in it, calling it interesting, saying progress had been made. But she also notes, in the meantime, sanctions remain in place. Our policy hasn't changed. And as the president stated, uh, we have sanctions on. They're very powerful. And we would not take those sanctions off unless North Korea denuclearized. Now, Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer issuing a list of demands in a letter to the president detailing what would be acceptable to Democrats, saying North Korea must agree to, among other things, dismantle all nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons programs, suspend ballistic missile tests, and commit to anywhere, anytime inspections. Schumer also had this to say. If president Trump meets with Kim Jong-un and receives a deal that truly lives up to these principles, he will have made the world a much safer place. 
But if he tries to reach a deal with Kim Jong-un just for the sake of reaching a deal, then he'll have been bested at the negotiating table yet again. As for where things stand, guys, the president meets with Secretary Pompeo for lunch behind closed doors as teams in Singapore and on the DMZ continue preparations. I, Thank you, Griff. All right, Griff, thanks. Well, that is such uh, politics. If this were a Democratic president, by the way, doing exactly what President Trump was doing, you think they would have that reaction? They didn't. <laughs> yeah. We already not. saw it with Iran. But meanwhile, the Korean uh, Herald is saying that uh, they've already met five times, and the two sides appear to agree that North Korea will denuclearize around 2020 in a short period of time. They're also talking about transferring some of the nuclear weapons out of the country within months. We'll take them. We've taken them before. Maybe China wants them. They got them already. Very interesting to see how this moves forward. I wonder if that is some of the stuff that was in the great big envelope that got delivered a couple right? of days ago. By right. the way, it looks as if the hotel where this could all happen could probably be the Shangri-La uh, in Singapore. Oh, I've, so I stayed the Shangri-La because I used to live in Singapore with my family. It's there a you beautiful go. hotel. I wonder who's paying, though, still. Is it part of the Shangri-La that's going to pay for Kim I think the United States there? is paying for his stay. But, but evidently, they're insulted by the fact that we might pay. So we have to, what, we have yeah. to somehow get them the money. Money, slip it under the mattress. Mm. I'm not sure, but but Maybe the Shangri La. Do they offer a king bed or double beds? The, uh, <laughs> Good question, Pride. But you, speaking of being insulted, that is how the president is feeling this morning, I believe, with the Eagles. They have now said, uh, well, only nine of them at this point were to agreeing Times, to go yeah. to the White House. Of course, they won the Super Bowl. The president said. Fine, then. This whole thing is off. No one from the Eagles team is coming to the White House. Instead, we're going to throw a birthday bash for America. This is a statement from the president himself. He says they disagree with their president because he insists that they proudly stand for the national anthem, hand on heart in honor of the great men and women of our military and the people of our country. The Eagles wanted to send a smaller delegation, but the 1,000 fans planning to attend the event, they deserve better. These fans are still invited to the White House to be part of a different type of a ceremony, one that will honor our great country country, pay tribute to the heroes who fight to protect it, and loudly and proudly play the national anthem. So no problem with the Astros wanting to come, no problem with the college champs want to come, but again, like the Golden State Warriors who said, we don't think we're showing up, uh, the Eagles stay home. This would have been a perfect opportunity to say, okay, Mr. President, I disagree with you, whether it's the anthem or your politics, have a conversation. Right. If you ever met the president, he's open. He, he has conversations with right. all sides all the time. Come in and sure. let's talk about what's happening with the league. You could start bridging things instead of just staying home. So now they got to go to the facility on Tuesday yeah. instead of the White House today. Uh, in fact, uh, there were a number of uh, Democrats who invited the team to show up uh, up on Capitol Hill and they will give them a tour. Apparently, one of the worries was that they would have the event at the White House and then when they played the national anthem, somebody might kneel. That was one of the worries. But obviously, the message from the president is if you don't want to stand for the national anthem, you're not invited. The mayor of the great city of Philadelphia, Jim Kinney, put out a statement and said this. These are players who stand up for the causes they believe in and who contribute in meaningful ways to their community. Disinviting them from the White House only proves that our president is not a true patriot, but a fragile egomaniac obsessed with crowd size and afraid of the embarrassment of throwing a party to which no one wants to attend. So what is his point? That he wants to become, raise his profile? If you invite 70 players, world champions, to the White House and nine show up, why bother going through the invitations? Clearly the Eagles saying, I'd rather do anything else. So the president says, I'm yeah. a busy guy. I'll do something else. What, 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 what these, choice do you have? It's not like he told 70 people to stay home. They right. chose to stay home. Yeah. And to your point, what, what do these players not get about what's going on in the country right now? If you, if you took a poll right. about the national anthem and whether or not you should stand for the anthem, I'd want to be where the American people are. And they all say, stand for the national anthem. they do. Stand to, for that American flag. To the Eagles' flag. credit, uh, Abby, they do stand. Uh, and they're upset that the president weighed in uh, a couple of weeks ago with us. And he said, listen, I'm not happy that you're even staying in the locker room. I'm not happy that you have an option to stay in the locker room and not stand. You should just stand for the national anthem. That should be the rule. The players were offended by that. They happen to have an owner that called this president, uh, his, called his presidency disastrous. So, you know, Jeff Lurie said he was going to show up, but that's how he felt. Right. But still, at least he was going to show up. Usually these uh, kind of events where a winning team comes are non-political. Today, it's very political. Nonetheless, yeah. the show will go on. The fans are still, still invited. Everybody's uh, apparently the White House is trying to contact everybody. Come on back at 3 o'clock. 
The, uh, I think the Marine Corps band is going to be performing. There will be a, and you can imagine they'll be standing for the. I show. still think that I, the nine players should have been invited. Show the others what they're missing out on. Uh, what an honor it is to be the White House, regardless of uh, who's president. I know you disagree with me on that, Brian, but be the bigger person here. Keep those nine players, have them come, and remind right. the other players what they're missing. But, I, you know, Abby, I, I know what you're saying, but the optics matter to see the president walk into the room and see nine players behind him. Maybe you're saying the numbers most matter? Most of the coaches <laughs> out of 70. You know, it's not the yeah. basketball team where you got 10 or 12. You know, you're going to have basically the trainer, the owner, and a handful of guys. So yeah. now Philadelphia gets to go home to their facility and have practice. Yeah. I, just, I think of my brothers in the, in the Navy. They don't ask what president they're serving. They serve this country. And if they got the opportunity to go to the White House, they would be so honored oh, and so proud but, to be there. But, Abby, your brothers would stand for the anthem. Well, absolutely. That's not even a question. And, but that, is, that was a predicament that we are presented with, given now the situation that the NFL has uh, placed the teams in. You know, they've come up with a new policy where if you don't want to stand, just stay in the locker room. Nick Saban told his colleagues. Players, I know they're college. He says everyone's going. I don't care what your political view is. Everyone's going. Your national championship up out of the White House. Why can't the owner just say everybody go? I know where you stand. Use this opportunity to sit down in the East Room. You could do this below the wire. Kellyanne Conway, big Eagles fan, mm -hmm. could have facilitated the right. whole thing. Have a conversation with the president. Yeah. Tell him exactly what you think. Use exactly. that opportunity. I think it's a great point. Tell us what you think. Friends at FoxNews.com. Did the president do the right thing here? All right, there's a lot going on, though. I want to bring you some other headlines. We are following a hunch from a retired detective helped lead police right to a suspected serial killer. Dwight Jones found shot dead in an Arizona hotel room after allegedly murdering six people in a matter of six days. He then killed himself as officers closed in. At least four victims are now linked to his 2009 divorce. His ex-wife claims her current husband, a retired detective, realized that connection and then called the police. Wow. Yikes. Also today, millions of voters will head to the polls in eight different states. All eyes are on the state of California, where Democrats hope to flip at least 10 congressional seats needed to take control of the U.S. House. The gubernatorial race also heating up. Democratic Lieutenant Governor Gavin Newsom looking to succeed as boss Jerry Brown. Republican John Cox hopes an endorsement from President Trump is enough to secure a second place. The top two primary candidates from either party will then advance to the November election. It could be an interesting one for Democrats. We'll see how that plays out. And a former Navy sailor pardoned by President Trump set to sue the Obama administration, Christian Saucier, spent a year in federal prison after photos of a nuclear submarine were found on his cell phone. Saucier argues that Hillary Clinton faced similar accusations but got to walk free. He joined us on Fox & Friends right after receiving that pardon. Listen. It was a clear attempt by the Department of Justice, you know, under Obama to use me as a scapegoat to uh, take the heat off Hillary Clinton. His suit will name former President Obama and former FBI Director James Comey, among others. And First Lady Melania Trump honoring the families of heroes who made the ultimate sacrifice. More than 40 Gold Star families attending a special reception at the White House yesterday. The First Lady tweeting these photos saying she and the President were honored to pay tribute to those heroes. It was her first public appearance since undergoing kidney surgery last month. All that speculation, there she is. There she is. All right, coming up. All right, uh, Republicans are working together to plan their message for the midterms. Our next guest shared her ideas and the stats with the Republican caucus. She'll be joining us live to tell us what the message was to the right. Plus, this woman's appearance on a TV show ended up saving her life, all thanks to a doctor watching the show at home. The incredible story you have to hear coming up on this Tuesday, Fox and Friends. to tackle ahead of the midterms who resonate with the voters. And they're not alone. House GOP officials met to brainstorm how to save their majority. They were presented with various plans from the Cook Report on down, including one from our next guest, who really resonated, according to almost all reports. That person is joining us right now, Kristen Solis. Uh, Kristen Solis uh, Anderson joins us. Uh, she's a Washington Examiner columnist, and she's an analyst that her presentation really resonated. First off, you talk about headwinds and tailwinds. What are the headwinds uh, with the Republican Party? 
So the problem Republicans are going to face is that Democrats are really fired up right now, not even looking at polls, looking at just who has shown up to vote in special elections, in primary elections. Democrats who never vote are turning out much more, uh, much more frequently. So Republicans are going to have to match that enthusiasm on their side of the aisle. And the way to do that uh, might be with, uh, with uh, impeachment and Pelosi. Did you find that? Well, there's poll after poll that shows Nancy Pelosi is one of the least popular figures in American politics. And she has said that if Democrats take back the House, uh, she's going to be running for speaker. She wants to continue leading. So that's certainly one piece of the puzzle. But impeachment is another. There are even voters who don't love President Trump. Maybe they don't love the tweets, but they don't want to see him impeached. And there is a large portion of the Democratic base that wants to see mm -hmm. impeachment. As soon as Democrats take Congress, they want to see impeachment begin. And for voters in the middle, that's just more obstruction, that's more gridlock, that's not what they're looking for out of Washington. So uh, so the president's poll numbers are improving, the economy is soaring, that's good, but it allows the uh, Americans to focus on what? Health care. That does not seem good for either party, does it? Health care is an issue that really fires up the Democratic base because they are worried about wanting to protect Obamacare. Uh, they think the longer Republicans have control, the more chances they'll have to try to take it apart. Meanwhile, for Republican voters, it doesn't energize them as much because Republicans have been in charge for two years and did not fully repeal and replace. So it's a tougher issue, you know, with folks feeling good about the economy. Now they're going, right. well, what about those things I have to spend money on at home? And health care is a huge expense. So we watch the generic poll shrink by just all accounts it's shrinking you can uh, play with the numbers if you have six months left what should republicans focus on uh to make the most ground and to make the most possible ground up I think Republicans need to keep talking about the economy and they need to keep selling the tax reform plan that they passed back in December. If you look at the generic ballot, if you look at the president's job approval, it's right when that bill passed that all of those numbers started to get a lot better because it gives Republicans the opportunity to say, look, this great economic growth, it's because of mm -hmm. our policies. It's because of the, our economic worldview. Don't you guys want more of that? That's the message they can sell to voters if For, they talk more about that. Tax right. Reform and Kristen, bill. the first week in June, does it look like the Senate secure and the House does a toss up. Was that your message? Well, I think the Senate is in much better shape than the House, in part because Republicans have the Democrats on such defense. There's so many vulnerable Democratic senators. In states that President Trump won, we're going to have to explain why they voted against the president's agenda time and time again to an electorate that likes the president. Yeah, both sides, uh, six months to go, uh, whoever has the better game plan will win. This is not baked, in, uh, the cake is not baked yet. Kristen Soltis Anderson, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Thank you. All right. Uh, 20 minutes after the top of the hour, the head of Starbucks is brewing up political rumors after stepping down. Yep, is he going to run for president? Would you vote for him? Plus, call it a free-for-all. One mayor in California wants to give everyone $500. Is that a good idea? We'll debate that next. More bloodshed today on the Israel-Gaza border. Thousands of Palestinians expected to riot to mark the 51st anniversary of the Six-Day War, which expanded Israel's borders. At least 120 Palestinians have been killed in protests since the month of April. And nearly 70 people now confirmed dead in the devastating volcano eruption in Guatemala. First responders digging through ash and debris for survivors. But it is so hot in some places, it's burning their shoes. And a miracle among the devastation when a rescuer was able to pull a baby from the rubble and the baby is alive. That is a miracle. All right, Unbelievable. Abby. Unbelievable. What a beautiful baby. Thank you, Steve. All right, well, Stockton, California, Mayor Michael Tubbs planning to give a guaranteed universal income of $500 a month to residents. The 18-month experiment scheduled to take effect in 2019 is the latest effort to combat poverty and would be privately funded by the Economic Security Project. So the question is, is this a good idea? Is this going to work? Here to debate, Vice Chairman for the Center for Urban Renewal and Education, Mark Little, and co-founder of the Universal Income Project, Jim Pugh. Good morning, Jim. Gentlemen, thank you for being with us so early. Good morning. All right, Mark, start with you. Look, I think what everyone wants here is to give people opportunity to succeed. So you look at this latest experiment that's going on in California. At the end of 18 months, where do you think we're going to be? Well, I tell you, if it's about a handout, you're not going to be any uh, place different than where you are now. I mean, let's put this in context. 
we are talking about a guaranteed income in the middle of a booming economy where jobs are being created at a record pace. Mm -hmm. I mean, at Cure, we care about uh, folks who are hurting uh, and, and folks who need assistance. I was one of those people when I was shot and gunned down at USC uh, and left permanently disabled. Uh, it wasn't a handout that I needed. It was opportunity yeah. that I needed. The road to success is not uh, a handout. The road to success is personal responsibility and self-reliance. Jim? Yeah, I think it's important to recognize that basic income is not a handout. It's a hand up. It sets up people to achieve their own long-term economic success. Our country is founded on the idea that if you work hard, you should be able to get ahead. But if you travel around the country now, it's obvious to see that that's true for fewer and fewer people. Folks are working harder than ever, but many are being left behind. If you give people a base amount of cash every month, not only does it help them get up onto their own two feet, it will also drive their local economies when they spend that money at the local grocery store, or shopping mall, or restaurants, which in turn creates local job opportunities. Jim, that didn't work if in Finland because invest... other nations have tried this out. Finland is one of those, uh, a recent example, uh, where they, for universal guaranteed income, they paid $685 a month for people below a certain income level. They're now canceling that program. They, they've obviously seen that it's not done what they hoped it would. So how do we not learn from well, those other don't... examples? We don't know what Finland's program does yet. They, they haven't canceled the program. They're continuing with the original program. They've just decided with the new government not to do an extension that had been asked for. So we've yet to see what happens in Finland, but we've seen in other places that this program can have a really transformational effect on people's lives. Mark, you say that this is personal to you, that you have had your own life experiences that have taught you how to think now about all of this. Tell us about that. Well, I'll, t I'll just tell you that uh, in 1987, I was shot by a gang member in an attempted armed robbery. Uh, and when I came out of rehab, I checked myself out of rehab and I worked two jobs. Uh, I had the opportunity to be on financial assistance. And I said, that is not the life that I want to live. Uh, I think that uh, assistance is important, but when it becomes a lifestyle, you have a problem. We look at what happened when we made that, uh, that mistake in 1935 mm. that led to fathers leaving the homes, and now we have 73% of black homes led by single mothers. Uh, and we know that when there are two parents in the home who are working, uh, certainly there's, uh, the statistics show that 2% of those people are in poverty, as opposed to African-American mothers, single, 85% are in poverty. That is not the direction that we need to go. Uh, we need to, like the mayor of Stockton himself, who is the youngest mayor in Stockton, first African-American, he didn't get there by not working hard. Uh, this program and programs like this have been studied since 1968 through 1980 in this country under Reagan, mm -hmm. under Carter, and under Nixon. And they failed because they produced lesser work hours that uh, ultimately led to lesser income for the recipients. All right. This program hurts recipients. It doesn't help them. We will see where this ends in 18 months. Mark, Jim, great to have you on this morning. Good to see you both. Thanks for having Thank me. Thank you. Thank you. All right, coming up, the left is launching a culture war on conservatives from cheering the end of Roseanne to liberal comedians attacking the White House. Our next guest says it is time for conservatives to start fighting back, and he's got a plan for that. Plus, they say that beans are good for your heart. It turns out they're also good for taking down armed criminals. That's a tease for you. More on that coming up. Conservatives to build their own cultural institutions. But how do you do that? Town Hall columnist Kurt Schlichter wrote all about it in a new op-ed, and he joins us now. Kurt, great to see you this morning. What is your plan? What do conservatives need to do? Well, conservatives need to do a number of things, Abby. But the first things we need to do is realize we're in a fight. You're right. There is a culture war going on. And, and the liberal elite are the aggressors. They're coming at us left and right. You know, they got really angry when we got all uppity and elected Donald Trump, when we refused to elect the person they told us we were supposed to. And now they're kind of sulking. We're getting a lot of passive aggression mm -hmm. uh, as well as aggressive aggression. And uh, we need to realize we're in a fight. Because you say cultural elites are trying to marginalize average Americans and conservatives in particular. 
Absolutely. They they can't get us out of government because we, you know, we voted in a Republican Congress. We voted in a Republican president. But they do control the institutions. They got Hollywood and they got academia and they even have big business. You know, this this myth about uh, giant corporations being run by a bunch of conservatives. That's just crazy talk. It's just not true. Look at Starbucks, for instance. This is a giant corporation and it's it's woker than woke. It, it, we need to understand, as, as normal conservative Americans, that you know everybody who controls the heights of power in right. the culture outside of the government uh, is against us. And mm -hmm. once we realize that, then we can take action. You know, uh, what do you say to uh, Democrats watching right now? Say, really? We feel like we're at war undoing the regulations, those regulations, especially on the environment. They feel as though President Trump is going to war on everything President Obama has done. They feel like they're under attack. Well, it's called a counterattack. I learned about those at Fort Benning. See, when they start a fight, we fight back. And what we're doing it is exercising our power really the only way we can, which is at the ballot box. And the ballot box has allowed us to control the legislature and control the executive. Right. And we're undoing a regimen of regulation and rules that we didn't ask for, that we didn't approve of, that were kind of instituted with a pen and a phone. Do you think that Roseanne and Barr should have been fired? That's I think ABC can do whatever it wants with its brand. I think ABC was looking for an excuse to get rid of what it saw as a cultural hot potato. And the cultural hot potato was a show that was perceived as being sympathetic to the kind of people who elected Donald Trump. Whether that's all true or not doesn't matter. What really matters is what the executives in Hollywood have to do at uh, cocktail parties when right. their friends gather around them and say, how can you do that? Sure. Uh, ABC, it's ABC's right to get rid of somebody who doesn't share their values. That's fine, but we got to understand but that they had a the problem values, with though, Roseanne. Kurt, was, she tweeted Roseanne something fine. racist. It wasn't about whether they agreed with her values or not, right? Well, what she what she tweeted was tacky, and I don't know anybody who agrees with it. And that's why she, uh, that's why ABC did what they did. Uh, if you'd like to read his uh, town hall op-ed, check it out online. Kurt, we thank you very much for joining us today from L.A. Hey, thanks for having Good me. Good to see you this you morning. Bet. It's religious views. The 72 ruling determining the Colorado Civil Rights Commission showed an anti-religious bias when ruling against Jack Phillips. That baker, Jack Phillips, he's joining us live later on this morning. The first cable news interview you will see with him. Also, this a Starbucks executive is brewing up presidential rumors. Howard Schultz announcing he will step down as the company's executive chairman later this month. The 64-year-old vocal critic of the Trump administration telling the New York Times he is considering public service saying this quote for some time now I've been deeply concerned about our country the growing division at home and our and our standing in the world stay tuned for that and a man swinging a hammer gets bushwhacked a sheriff's deputy using two cans of baked beans to take down a man threatening people with a hammer at a Florida grocery store it gave other officers just enough time to tackle and arrest him the deputy says that the cans of Bush's extra brown sugar baked beans were an <laughs> alternative to using right. deadly force. I'm going to use that in the future. All right, buying a beach house may have just saved this woman's life. Nicole McGinnis recently appeared on the HGTV show Beachfront Bark and Hunt to celebrate the end of her brain cancer treatments. But a doctor watching at home noticed a lump on her neck and contacted her on Facebook. She then got checked out and is now undergoing treatment for thyroid cancer. Back in 2015, another viewer spotted a lump on an HGTV star, which turned out to be cancer as well. Unbelievable. Unbelievable indeed. Saved the lives. A reminder, reach out to people if you've got a concern, I guess. All right. Yeah, especially wow. if they're on television. <laughs> uh, we're on television, and so is Janice Dean yeah, with the okay. weather. Yeah, so far. Yeah, we're not Janice. doctors, though. We will, do you have an email address in case something? All right.
Oh, my goodness. Hi, how are you today? Let's take a look at the current temperatures. 58 here in New York City, a little cooler than average across the Great Lakes and the Northeast. 53 in Kansas, or rather Cincinnati. Kansas City, we've got 57 for you. There's our past 24 hours, so we have the potential for some stronger to severe storms later on this afternoon as we get the daytime heating and then continuing into perhaps the overnight. The highest risk for severe storms will be across the northern plains, but we can't rule out maybe some hail damaging winds across the central U.S. and parts of the Gulf Coast states. So watching that, there are your highs today, really warm across the central U.S., 94 in Dallas, 91 in Kansas City, even uh, Minneapolis at 80. We're at 76 in New York City. And just a quick look, active in the Pacific as well. This will be our first named storm in the next five days, we think. The good news is this storm will be moving away from land. That's the way we like it. We could have lots of hurricanes as long as they move away from <laughs> right. land. Yeah. Back to you. Not good for the fish. Well, the fish can handle it. Right. That's yeah. why they're in the we water. We could ask or them. The people. <laughs> right. Thank you, All right. Us. Thank you. Uh, coming up, Congresswoman Mia Love, National Economic Council Director Larry Kudlow, and Chris Kobach, the Secretary of State of my home state of Kansas, all here live. And it's like we're bragging. We are. Kind of. Uh, and almost. President Trump says he has the absolute right to pardon himself, but won't have to because he says he's done nothing wrong. What does Judge Napolitano think? He is on the case, and he joins us next. All right, here comes the judge. And nobody's got to worry about nothing. Don't go hitting that panic button. All right, some quick headlines now. Dolly Parton may be working nine to five on her latest project with Netflix. The country singer is planning an eight episode series with each chapter based on one of her songs. Is it set to, it's set to debut next year? Well, look at all the lyrics. And a new Apple feature will shame you for using your phone too much. The monitoring app called Screen Time helps you track uh, how much time you spend on your iPhone. Users can view detailed activity reports and even set up time restrictions for specific apps, websites, or categories. For us, it's kind of weird because we kind of have a job that wants us to stay on top of things. But it's when we're not at the job. That's what they're trying to do. Is that the voice in my head? Meanwhile, President Trump weighing in as the self-pardon scenario takes center stage, tweeting, quote, as has been stated by numerous legal scholars, I have the absolute right to pardon myself, but why would I do that when I have nothing done nothing wrong? In the meantime, the never-ending witch hunt led by 13 very angry and conflicted Democrats and others continues into the midterms. We're going to break it all down. Fox News senior judicial analyst, Judge Andrew Napolitano. Judge, Good morning. you've been Good a busy morning, man guys. lately. We're all trying to keep up every day with the latest developments, but on the pardoning, we had Kellyanne on yesterday, and she seemed to be frustrated that we're even using that word, that we're been talking about. I share her frustration. And listen, it's not Rudy Giuliani's fault. He didn't raise it. Chuck Todd did. In retrospect, had it been me, I would have said, I'm not going there. But now when, the president's tweeting about it. Well, now the president's uh, tweeting about it. Of course, it, it's we're talking about it, so it's part of the 24-48 hour uh, news cycle. So the argument in favor of the president can pardon himself is the pardoning power, according to the Supreme Court, is plenary, meaning full, mm -hmm. final, complete. There's no check on it. The argument against that is the Constitution embodies the rule of law. One of the basic principles of the rule of law is a person can't be the prosecutor or the judge in his own case. I think the stronger argument is, most respectfully, that the president cannot pardon himself. There are pardons and there are pardons. President Trump has pardoned people who've already committed crimes. When President Ford pardoned then recently former President Nixon, Nixon hadn't been charged with anything. He just basically said, I'm wiping out, I'm preventing anybody from charging you with anything from the moment of your birth up to the date of my pardon. So there's a variety of, uh, of, uh, of ways the pardon power can be utilized. He's not gonna get indicted. Well, I disagree with Rudy Giuliani, and I profoundly disagree with the image he created. Why he would create this image is beyond me. Now, I'm quoting him. The president could have James Comey shot right. in the Oval Office and couldn't be prosecuted Why for even it. say that? But the image is horrific and, and demeaning uh, for everybody involved in it. But it's wrong on the law. If that were or something like that were to happen, the president would be charged, would be indicted, but would not be tried until after he left office right. because it is the trial that would take him away from being the president of the United States. I think but what are the odds of, I see you right. laughing, what are the odds of something like that happening? We'll be getting back in the White House for anything. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs>
<laughs> well, Rudy's famous for using colorful language, and that's it, a little bit of it. Uh, the president has just, in the last uh, couple of minutes, tweeted this out. What is taking so long with the inspector general's report on crooked Hillary and slippery James Comey? Numerous delays. Hope report is not being changed and made weaker. There are so many horrible things to tell. The public has the right to know. Well, he has a legitimate. He has a legitimate gripe there because we all expected that report to be out by now. We thought the inspector general was going to testify about it tomorrow on Capitol Hill. If he is, it would have to come out today. Now, there are reports and there are reports, just like there are pardons and there are pardons. Right. This particular type of report, if you're going to be quoted and if they go to you and present the quote and make sure it's what you said, that's a little time consuming. I think the president's fears that it's being watered down are legitimate fears. And if it appears to be watered down, I want to see the version before it was watered down. Yeah. And a word is DOJ is doing it. They're the ones who are not letting it go. The DOJ, the DOJ that the president the pe put together. The people that are supposed to work for the president. Yeah. Uh, his administration. Yes. All right. Judge, I don't know how you sleep at night. Only in America. These days. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> right. Thank Thank it's like having a law class. All these hypotheticals. <laughs> yep, all the Good best. All right. All right, meanwhile, uh, 12 minutes before the top of the hour, one town is just days away from launching a new law aimed at gun owners. Hand the new weapons or pay the price. But gun rights, this, we're going to tell you, coming up. The village of Deerfield, Illinois, is only uh, about a week away from implementing an ordinance directing residents to hand in their what they consider assault weapons or face hefty fines. But gun groups won't let this happen without a fight. One of those groups is the Illinois State Rifle Association and its director, the executive director, Richard Pearson, joins us from Chicago. Richard, good morning to you. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Uh, what do they consider an assault weapon? Well, they made up their own definition, but certainly an AR-15 or a 30-round magazine, uh, all those kinds of things are considered assault weapons by the uh, village of Deerfield. Okay, and so you've got until next week to, to bring them down to the city hall, or what's going to happen? Well, they can confiscate them by force, apparently, or they can fine you $1,000 a day, or probably both. What's your problem with this? Well, for one thing, uh, when we passed the Concealed Air Carry Act in 2013, uh, we preempted local uh, ordinances from doing this sort of thing. And so it's a direct violation of state law, not to mention the Second Amendment. Well, they say in Deerfield, they say that um, uh, state and federal authorities have failed to regulate the possession, manufacture, and sale of assault weapons. So essentially, they're taking matters into their own hands because the feds and the state aren't doing anything. That's true, but they have to answer the federal government and the state government, which they decided not to do. It's kind of a slippery slope that they're going down, isn't it? I'd say it's very slippery, yes. All right. So where does this wind up going? Well, right now we're uh, looking for a temporary restraining order uh, to prevent this from happening. It goes into effect June 8th, and uh, if we get the temporary order, then it will... Uh, uh, stay all this uh, activity until we have a full court hearing. Mm -hmm. Richard, uh, the people behind this in Deerfield say that they are doing things like this to try to deter some sort of a mass shooting. Is it a good idea well, in that regard? Well, it, it doesn't help with mass shootings. If people want to do a mass shooting, they're going to do a mass shooting. Uh, Illinois is a little bit different than every other state because every gun owner in the state that has a FOID card goes through a background check every night of the year. So if you've looked at the history of Illinois, we're, we don't have any of those or very few of those uh, in our history. And so we're much more tightly regulated yeah. than the other states anyway. Uh, we did reach out to the uh, village of Deerfield's mayor and the board and have not yet received a reply. So you see this going to court, right? Oh, absolutely, yes. Because what's at stake? Well, we think uh, it's a slippery slope. Everything is at stake for us. And so we will fight this all the way to the Supreme Court without question. All right. Uh, Richard Pearson, the executive director of the Illinois State Rifle Association, joining us today from Chicago. Richard, thank you. Thank you very much. Have a great day. All right. You as well.
Uh, what do you think about that? Email us, friends at foxnews.com. Meanwhile, it's a no-fly zone at the White House. President Trump unveiling, uh, uninviting, that is to say, the Philadelphia Eagles over the national anthem protest. Your email pouring in, plus the president just tweeted about it. Plus, Congresswoman Mia Love is going to be with us, Larry Kudlow, the president's economic council director, and Chris Kobach, the secretary of state for the great state of Kansas. Straight ahead.